Thank you very much for your endurance. Um, thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce the second panel. The, the first, we resolved all the, all the domestic issues in Egypt. And now on this panel, we're going to try to resolve all the foreign policy issues in Egypt. We have um, a collection of, uh, I think, old friends and new friends who I'd like to introduce to you. At, at the far end, uh, Amr Hamzawi, who is well known in Washington because of the excellent work he did at the Carnegie Endowment for National Peace. Uh, I think all of us who go from Washington to Egypt are then struck at the role that Amr has now played in politics in Egypt. I think he, you are my only friend who's ever been on a billboard. <laughs> and I think that is likely to be the same. He was a, 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 a parliamentarian in the previous uh, People's Assembly. Uh, he is, as all my, my panelists that, uh, in this panel is on television, but is a, a commentator and analyst and a, a deep thinker uh, representing, I think, an articulate uh, viewpoint of, of the liberal view in Egypt. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Darag is the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of the Freedom and Justice Party, uh, trained as a civil engineer in the United States, uh, a thoughtful and frequent participant in global debates, and I think a very uh, a very articulate representation of, of the view of the ruling party in Egypt. And then at, on, on this end, uh, General Samech Seyf al Yazal, uh, a veteran of military intelligence in Egypt, uh, the head of the Gumhuria Center, a think tank which he founded after the revolution, remains close to many people with whom he used to serve in the military. And I think what we have here is a very nice balance of the different views of people who are working among themselves to arrive at the question of what Egypt's position, what the new Egypt's position in the new Middle East is. And, and so I'd like to start just by asking that question. What is the position of the new Egypt in the new Middle East? What is the role of the new Egypt in the new Middle East? And why don't we start with the general? Sure, thank you very much, John, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, glad to be with you today. Uh, this is my second uh, public uh, panel. Actually, I don't know why they put me with public panels, but anyway, uh, God bless us today. Anyway, uh, yes, it is uh, a big issue now uh, after the revolution, uh, especially after uh, July 1st, uh, when we start to have a new administration uh, coming from the Muslim Brotherhood, definitely the foreign policy of Egypt uh, has been changed. Uh, I can give one example on that, which uh, I uh, somehow disagree for with this policy, uh, which is uh, Iran. I think uh, what we're doing with Iran now uh, is uh, not uh, very well uh, in, in the favor of uh, Egypt and Egyptians. Uh, I can say that uh, running behind Iran in that way, uh, throwing us in, in their lap uh, in that way, as well as uh, uh, getting uh, all risks uh, w with the other Arab uh, friends and, uh, and brothers in the Gulf, which they are really annoyed about what we're doing with Iran, uh, is not in our favor. Uh, maybe someone will say, uh, oh, Emirates, uh, the, the Iranian, they are occupying three, uh, um, uh, three uh, islands, uh, Tanab al-Kubra, Tanab so greater Tanab, so smaller Tanab, and Abu Musa, and still they have, they are maintaining a good relation with Iran, not good relation, at least a diplomatic relation. Uh, my answer to that is different. I mean, when you, you cannot compare that with Egypt, uh, because, for instance, the, uh, we are upsetting the, the Emirates very much, of course, because of this uh, policy with Iran. Uh, we don't, the, the, the Emirates, they don't need Egyptian investors to go there, but we need uh, Emirati investors. We need the green light from the government of United Arab Emirates to their investors to come invest in Egypt, which we are, we are in, in bad need for that. Uh, in the meantime, we are upsetting Saudi Arabia, we are upsetting uh, Bahrain, we are upsetting uh, Kuwait. So you have to actually, just like a chess, when you, before you move your piece, you have to see the reaction, what you're going to expect from the other side. Uh, I believe we did not uh, uh, um, put that in mind. Uh, what, why I'm afraid of Iran? Why I'm against this policy? Three things. 
Uh, I'm just giving an example for wrong policies, wrong foreign policies with Egypt now, uh, an existing uh, administration. Three things. Number one, I'm really afraid of exporting the Khomeini Iranian theory and ideas to Egypt. Does Dira Saur al Irani? This is scaring. I don't like to see my country, another, another Iran. Number two, spreading the Shia theory and practice in Egypt. Egypt, I am a Muslim, moderate, very moderate, Sunni. And we want our country to be as Sunni as before. OK, the yellow one. Very quick. Uh, so I, I'm against very much the Shia idea and the Shia theory to come to our country. Thirdly, which is the last one, because John is uh, raising the other card now, uh, is helping and paying by, by, by gives a lot of finance and, and finance power to some Egyptian groups in Egypt, politics or religious. I am against this very much. I am against, at the same time, the new law which is allowing the NGOs to receive foreign money without giving any indication. I mean, if you tell me I'm going to give you invoices, thank you very much. I can give you thousands of invoices tomorrow. But this money coming abroad for the NGOs, especially the religious one, I am against it 100%. Anyway, I will stop on that thank because you. John is there. Thank you. Dr. Omar. Okay. Uh, thank you, John. Just out of my three minutes, I, I just wish that uh, uh, during the previous session, uh, uh, any one of, uh, of our party uh, was presented because I, I believe the discussion would have been more rich if, uh, if one of uh, representing the Freedom and Justice Party was, uh, was there. Uh, and, uh, or, or uh, actually a professional uh, pro politician. Maybe Amr Hamza also shares this opinion with me. I mean, people were talking about parties and without any p person belonging to any party, anybody except, of course, uh, Mr. Nagib, but he's now not chairing the party, as I understand, so. You are? Okay, good. <laughs> good. I don't, I, this is the first time that I ever saw him, you know. I, okay. <laughs> but I'm proud of seeing him, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, now my, my three minutes starts. <laughs> uh, well, Everybody, I believe everybody who, who loves Egypt was not very happy about uh, how the status of Egypt on the international arena deteriorated over the last um, at least maybe 20 years. Uh, Egypt is a very uh, uh, big country, is a very civilized country, has always been effective uh, uh, universally. But uh, if you, thank you, if you, if you follow up uh, what Egypt has been doing on the on the foreign relations uh, over the last 20 years, you, you you actually get very sad. You know how 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 the status became that uh, that low. So our our strategy uh, in the Freedom and Justice Party towards mending this situation, and I hope that this is uh, eventually shared by 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 all uh, political forces in the country, because this is something I believe that that can we can achieve a very good agreement on outside of the uh, uh, discussions and fights uh, over domestic politics and, uh, and elections and things like that. This is something that we can seriously discuss and reach uh, a good agreement on. Uh, we, for, for Egypt, for the new Egypt, we are hoping to have balanced relationship with everyone, uh, with all countries, east, west, north, south, uh, uh, not in any particular direction. And the relationships should be based on mutual interests, should be based on mutual respect, rather than you know, dictating uh, uh, any kind of, uh, of, uh, of policies or, uh, or things to do. Uh, definitely, there is a very good connection between uh, internal affairs and external affairs. We, Egypt can never have a very uh, strong role internationally unless it is strong and powerful internally and this is we realize this very well and i hope we, we we all of us in egypt work together in order to to develop egypt to the extent that we are strong internally so that we are effective externally but on the other hand the the the, the a very active foreign relations uh, uh, help very much the to 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 enhance the situation domestically and uh, this is something, this is a very important role for foreign policy that needs to be 
plate. When we talk about balanced relationship with everybody, it is, uh, I'm, 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 I'm a bit surprised that my friend, uh, General Sameh, started by criticizing. I mean, he didn't, he didn't give me any break. He just started to criticize. I had only three minutes. I have to do the <laughs> criticizing very quickly. Yes, but, uh, but actually, I do not really absorb that. Where, where is, I mean, where is this running into the Iranians? I mean, when we talk about balanced relationship with everybody, I mean, we, we, we still do not have diplomatic relationships with Iran. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, in order, we, we realize very well that in order to be effective on the, on the international arena, you have to have ties with everybody in order to be able to, to uh, exercise influence. If we, if we want to make any progress on the Syrian front, for example, how can we do that without having a minimum amount of talk with the Iranians? Uh, the same way, if we, if we want to have peace and stability and, 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 uh, and uh, and calmness in Gaza. How can we do that without talking to, to, to people in Hamas? This is, it is very important in order to be an effective player on the international arena to keep your ties uh, uh, connected with everybody in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I believe the dynamics on, uh, on this panel are going to give you a sense of how squeezed liberals are between the military establishment on the one hand and the Muslim Brotherhood on the other hand. <laughs> So in a way, <laughs> in a way, John is simply following the very logical uh, John order. Is presenting the Muslim and, and no, 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 I'm not. No, 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 I'm not. I'm, I'm not going I'm to. I'm the to, American not, mediator I'm, who's going to solve this uh, all who, the who, next hour. No, 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 no. I mean, do not say an American mediator because American mediator used to be used to be a mediator and is no longer a mediator because is getting extremely biased. But that is a different question. <laughs> So I would, I would say John Alterman is a mediator in his capacity as John Alterman, and I respect that, but not as an American mediator. Now, let me, let me, uh, let me turn into what I, what I would like to, uh, to highlight with regard to uh, foreign as well as regional, uh, regional issues. Uh, number one, um, I believe in, 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 uh, in the current environment uh, and looking at the different uh, domestic challenges Egypt is facing uh, constitutional, political, social, and economic. Our number one foreign and regional policy priority has to be uh, to improve economic and trade relations uh, in the region and beyond the region. And that number one foreign policy priority to improve economic and trade relations um, should take Egyptian diplomacy uh, in new directions. I am, not, I am not in principle against reaching out to Iran. Uh, it should make Egypt focus on economic and trade components when it reaches out to the Gulf region or elsewhere. And it should mean as well that Egypt has to evaluate economic and trade relations based on our interests, on our national interests. And let me inject in, in that uh, picture um, uh, a remark of caution, because I'm, I'm increasingly worried about the fact that Egypt is borrowing uh, way too much money from Qatar. If you look at the foreign debt of Egypt, I'm going to, to refer to numbers so that we can get more of an objective discussion of what's going on. Uh, the foreign debt, the, exist, the current foreign debt of Egypt is uh, close to 35 billion US dollar. If you look at the existing structure of the foreign debt, of the 35 billion uh, US dollar, 20%, uh, around 20% of it is owned by Qatar, and that is too dangerous. It is a structural dependency in the making, which we have to watch out for. It should not be simply left to ideological uh, contestation, or to sloganeering, uh, or to bashing Qatar, or not bashing Qatar. I'm not interested in that stuff. I'm interested in avoiding that Egypt grows dependent in the sense of having 20%, close to 20% of its foreign debt owned by one country, and that one country pushes indirectly for changes uh, not to be introduced to our taxation system uh, in a way which uh, gives that country a uh, free ride to acquire and uh, to do acquisitions without paying taxes to the public treasury. That is a dangerous dependency which we have to watch out for, number one. Secondly, on, on economic and trade issues, and once again, I was uh, shocked, in fact, to give you a sense once again how, how we position ourselves as liberals really in between. I was 
uh, as, as, as critical I am of the president and his cabinet going to Qatar and borrowing and getting more money, be it um, uh, uh, with interest rates, by the way, and um, as critical I, as I have been with regard to the president and his cabinet's behavior with regard to lending and borrowing money, I am as critical of the discussion with regard to Iran coming from uh, everywhere else in Egypt. Iran should not be reduced uh, in terms of uh, our need to reach out to Iran into um, uh, extremist positions based on doctrine-related doctrine, uh, doctrine -related matters. I mean, how comes that Egypt with 90 million Egyptians uh, w w with such a he great history uh, of um, be being the center of Sunni Islam, uh, how comes that that Egypt of 90 million Egyptians becomes afraid of a tiny number of Iranian tourists coming to Egypt in an annual basis? That is a discussion which you will hardly find anywhere else, and it's an extremist discussion, and I feel bad whenever a liberal voice joins in uh, taking the position of radical Salafis, saying no to Iranian tourists. That is not the way to conduct yourself in the region, and that is not the way to conduct yourself in foreign and regional policy. Do I have one, one more minute? One second? Ten seconds? <laughs> Twen so, okay, Zabai is the American medi mediator. <laughs> give me 40 seconds, you I will like you. Give me, give, give me 40 seconds, I will like you. Uh, <laughs> well, Americans will do anything to now, be liked. On, fine. So now, uh, third remark on, on, on Syria. And I'm sticking to, to regional issues, as uh, John asked us to, uh, to do. On, on, on Syria and Iran, uh, I believe, and I was supportive of um, uh, the president articulating a position in uh, defense of the Syrian uh, quest for uh, democracy and for human rights. However, I did not understand uh, reaching out to Iran without discussing the Syrian issue with the Iranians as well, since the Iranian government is the number one uh, government supporting the dictatorship in Syria. So if you are reaching out to Iran for different social and economic issues and for geostrategic issues, fine. Balance your relationship with the Arab Gulf, which is important. But if you are reaching out to Iran and you know well enough that Iran is the number one promoter of the dictatorship in Syria, so that needs to be a conditionality which we put forward before opening up or warming up to uh, bilateral relations with the Iranians. So what I'm missing here is a clear and a well-defined line sticking to human rights, sticking to freedoms, sticking to promoting freedom and human rights, and those are at the core of the Egyptian revolution. And I would have expected the first elected president to do so. So number one, to be aware of uh, national independence and not borrowing too much, too, way too, too, too much from Qatar. Secondly, to be accurate and well-spoken and uh, upfront with regard to human rights and Syria and not simply reaching out to Iran. And finally, for everyone else to avoid falling into the extremist trap of bashing the president for going to Iran based on doctrine-related uh, matters which are in nature extremists and should not be promoted in Egypt. Let, let me ask an, an intra-Arab question. And that is, it feels to me like Egypt is the source of a growing division, even within the Gulf Cooperation Council, where Saudi Arabia and the Emirates are very critical of the current <coughs> government of Egypt, and Qatar is extremely supportive of the current government of Egypt. Is that a problem for Egypt, that it doesn't have broad Gulf support? And if it is a problem, what should Egypt do to try to encourage broader Gulf Arab support. Okay, I'll start. I'm nodding mm. equal uh, politics is acting more than talking, so you have to act. It meaning that if you'd like to get a normal relation with Saudi Arabia and Emirates and Kuwait and others, you have to act politically in a way that you attract them back to your track, you attract them back to be a good relation with you and normal relation with you, not to having them on the other side. The, the, the existing Egyptian po foreign policy is actually eliminating them. They are putting them aside. They are, they are not, you are not encouraging them to come back to your arena and, and help you, not only politically but also economically, by many, many actions. I mean, and when, when, when Egypt, I'll give you one example, another, another example, very, very straightforward, Mali. 
Uh, Mali, of course, the Al Qaeda group were actually doing their best over there to, and fighting against the regime and trying to, to get control of the, of the country. What we did in Egypt, that we um, actually said, oh, France is doing a bad job over there. Why France is uh, invading uh, Mali? We don't like that, and we, uh, we are with the regime. Fine, this, this is, this is in, in, in general, that's okay. But look at that. Not, it's not because they are Muslims over there who are fighting, but they are from Al-Qaeda. You are upsetting Saudi Arabia by that. You are upsetting Emirates. You are upsetting other countries. That's not the way. You have to think twice before getting a decision. I have learned here in one of the strategic institutes in this city, in Washington, D.C., saying that you have to, get to take the right decision at the right time. Sometimes if you take a wrong decision at the right time, that that's sometimes it's okay, but you don't take a wrong decision at the wrong, at the wrong time. So that, that's, that's not correct. The point is sometimes we're taking wrong decisions in the wrong time. And that affects us, affects the country. It doesn't affect only your foreign policy, it affects your economic policy, it affects everything. Therefore, I, what my idea is, again, my friend, Amr, I think Amr should sit here, and uh, we have uh, John uh, as a border between the other side, but uh, Amr sat there wrongly, but I wanted to come next to me. Mm-hmm. But in, <laughs> uh, Amr over there. <laughs> Amr Hamzawi. But anyway, but Amr, Amr Drag is my friend as well, by the way. Uh, and we respect each other very, very well. No, just a joke. But the point is, <laughs> I, you see, it's a joke. Everybody laughs. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, back to the point. Uh, Amr Hamzawi said, uh, and it may be this first time to disagree with me, that uh, we, have, we shouldn't be actually uh, afraid from Iran and Iran tourists. What's, what's Iran tourists? Again, it's not only Iran tourists. My point of view, you are taking the, the decision now to get a normal relation with Iran, where Iran is threatening Israel, threatening uh, the, the Americans' uh, bases in the Gulf, uh, threatening American bases in the south of Europe by uh, uh, nuclear uh, bombs. And they're gonna, by the way, before end of September, Iran will, will have the first, first I'm, I'm, t- I'm, I'm telling you information now, I'm, I'm really, really responsible about that, the first atomic bomb, militarily, all right? The first one. They will produce the first one by end of September. I'm sure about that. So now we're talking about a nuclear power coming and threatening everybody. Why now you want to have a normal relation with them? I don't mind to have a relation with them, but not very tight relation. Not the way we are doing it. Not because they are, they are waving with two million uh, tourists, I'm going to give you some money. I don't want this money if they're going to come and, and, and export the revolution to me and, and spread Shia uh, th- theory and idea in, in my country, I don't want that. Def- I don't want that money, believe me. I can have a normal relation with them, that's fine with me, but not in that way, not in a speedy way. Step by step, sorry. I, I, w- I was hoping to keep it more on the intra-Arab side. And, and on the intra-Arab side, is it a problem that there's not broad GCC support for Egypt, should should it be an ob- or or should I say differently, should it be an objective of the government of Egypt to have broad GCC support, and what would be required to broaden that support? Definitely, it is our interest. We're not happy that uh, we don't have a good, normal and good relationship with the countries like uh, like the Emirates or Kuwait or or even sometimes sometimes Saudi Arabia. This is not. Uh, something that any Egyptian likes. And, uh, but let me remind you that uh, the first uh, country that uh, President Morsi visited after uh, he became president was Saudi Arabia. Actually, he was criticized for that as well. I know that, ironically. But, uh, and also he visited it one more time. And I know, personally, I know that there are uh, a lot of attempts to, 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 to have, whether with Saudi Arabia or, or, or the Emirates, to try to regain the good relationship between uh, between these countries and, and others, but uh, the notion that uh, that uh, that Qatar is something else and is trying to control Egypt and uh, and, and stuff like that, this is really uh, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure <coughs> how is this impression is reaching people. For example, the the financial support that Qatar started to provide for Egypt started during the time of the military council, not during the time of the President Morsi. As a matter of fact, uh, 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 the, 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 the $3 billion they, they talked about it didn't even reach Egypt yet. And that, right, I mean, during the time of the military council, Qatar started and promised, made that promise at that time that it is gonna pour 
10 billion dollars to the Egyptian economy, to the central bank, in order to support the Egyptian revolution. And that was before even the Freedom and Justice Party was established at all. No, before the elections, before anything. So the idea of tying this to the Muslim Brothers or the Freedom and Justice Party, I, I see baseless, actually. And uh, uh, on the other hand, although it seems that the, the, there are big differences, there are big differences between what Qatar is doing and what Saudi Arabia is doing and the Emirates is doing, but in reality, there is a very good degree of consensus between the, 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 all the GCC countries. They have strategic objectives and there are limits that no one can exceed. It's not like they are becoming enemies or anything like that. But as I, as I said, we, we hope that we, we retain and we, we, we regain good relationships with the Emirates and Saudi Arabia the way they have always been. The same thing applies to Iran. I mean, wh where, where is this intimacy that people are feeling between Egypt and Iran right now? All what is happening is that they're starting to be some admittance for some tourists to, do so, to go to some places in Egypt, which are beach places here and there, not even to Cairo. They are not even allowed to go to Cairo. Where, where, is, where are these intimate relations? I'm sure that there are more Iranian tourists going to the Emirates than they are going to Egypt. And uh, I mean, is, is, this, is this all, I mean, people are, are, are talking about, when we talk about that, uh, I, I agree with Amr, of course, but, and this is what we are really doing. When we talk with the Iranians, we tie any development in our relationship with Iran with progress in the way they are dealing with the Syrian crisis. So this is, this is absolutely, I mean, our, our position towards Syria is very clear. This is not on, a, on the account of our relations with Syria or, or anybody else. When you talk about Mali, we are not supporting the current regime. As a matter of fact, Al-Qaeda is not the current regime. I don't know if, if this, you know this, the, the, the current regime is not, the, the, the Al-Qaeda is rebels against the current regime. So we, are not, we, we never said that we are supporting the current, or we are supporting Al-Qaeda or anything like that. All what we said, all the president, what he said was that we do not, support international intervention. We would like uh, uh, conflicts to be solved peacefully. This is all. Nobody said, uh, not, nobody said anything about supporting Al-Qaeda or supporting, and this is uh, what is worrying Saudi Arabia. I don't know where is this coming from. I, 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 I believe that there are a lot of exaggerations about these aspects, and, uh, and we need to take this a little bit easy. We need to forget about domestic politics for, for, for a while and start talking seriously about what is the best interest of Egypt, okay, for when it comes to its foreign policy. There is a big area that we can agree upon in, in when it comes to this uh, item. Okay, well, that is exactly um, the major point, I believe, um, um, which, which, I, which I feel is missing. Uh, and it's, it's missing the national consensus uh, with regard to uh, foreign policy preferences, foreign policy priorities is missing, to my mind, uh, because the government is yet to articulate a clear vision on its foreign policy priorities with regard to the Middle East, with regard to the Arab world, as well as with regard to the different international ties which Egypt has sustained for a long time. Now, of course, there were expectations right after the revolution that once you have a regime change, the new regime, as it has been the case in many places, uh, reconsiders foreign policy preferences, reconsiders foreign policy alliances, and redefines some of them. In order to do so regionally or internationally, you have to have a vision. And what we are missing is a clear vision, even a, a vision in progress I cannot see. And let me, let me tell you very honestly that it, that is part of the inefficiency of the existing administration because the same missing vision is exactly what we are suffering from in domestic issues. We are missing a vision domestically as well as internationally and regionally. Second point. Now, if we were to have a vision, definitely the question of Iran needs to be approached pragmatically. It's not acceptable to ideologize or to put it in an ideological terms. It's not about ideology, and it's not about undermining our relationship with the Gulf, because the UEE has always had diplomatic and trade relations with Iran more than anyone else in the region. So they should not come and tell us, you are not allowed to go to Iran, because they have been Dubai. Dubai is a creation to a great extent of Iranian uh, money and of trade with Iran. So let's be honest and upfront. Egypt's 
relationships in the region or abroad should not be conditioned. But in order to have, in a conscious manner, a, a way of managing Egyptian foreign policy, we need a vision. Iran, we need conditionality with regard to human rights issues, with regard to the Syrian component, with regard to Iran in the Gulf, Iran and Iraq, and that needs to be pronounced and spelled out pragmatically. With regard to the GCC countries, we have, John, we have real issues on the ground. We have Egyptian guest workers in most of those countries, and that needs to be the number one priority. I do not understand what we talk about. It's about two million, I mean, right? Yes, over two million Egyptians are working in the GCC. <coughs> so um, our priority needs to be to focus on their conditions, social and economic conditions, on their legal status, as every single country with guest workers abroad do as every single country does when, when it has guest workers abroad. When it comes to trade relations and economic relations, yes, of course, the existing political class in Egypt, the new political class in Egypt, Islamist and otherwise, Islamist liberal, we have to understand that Gulf monarchies will continue to be fearful, and I'm putting it uh, not in diplomatic terms, will continue to be fearful, fearful of the, uh, the de democratic experiment. I'm not saying they are undermining it, but of course they are fearful of the fact that we are electing a parliament, that we elected a president, regardless I like or dislike him, but we have elect an elected president, and that democratic experiment is not one of, uh, one of, uh, one of the the positive sides which Gulf monarchies uh, see when they look at Egypt. So that component needs to be tackled and it needs to be deconstructed in our own interest by focusing on economic and, 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 and trade issues, on issues related to Egyptian guest workers. But we should not accept conditionality on our foreign policy, be it with regard to Iran or anywhere else, as long as we have a vision. But what we lack is a real vision, and that is not a regional issue, and that is not the uh, due to the, to the making of regional or external powers. It is our own fault, and I believe that is very much related to the inefficiency of the existing administration. So, 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 but, so let me follow up on that, because I think it bridges the first panel and the second panel. I mean, what, what, what you just said, was that Egypt doesn't have much of a foreign policy because there aren't politics surrounding a foreign policy. What do you think would be required to create different schools of thought, different political orientations around politics for people to use the political system to articulate and argue about what Egypt's priorities would be with a hope that politics would produce a policy instead of the absence of a policy, which I think we, we, we've largely heard people describe. What, what brings, how do you make Egyptian politics produce a discussion that leads to a policy? Why don't we start with Dr. Yeah. Uh before I answer this, I'm, I, I would like to respond to the, 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 the notion that there is no vision for the Egyptian foreign policy. Uh, maybe, maybe Amr is not aware of that vision, but there is a vision. And uh, I, I myself, I wrote, I wrote several articles. I, actually, I just remember, I went on TV with uh, my friend here, Dina Al-Fattah, for two, two episodes, one and a half hours each, talking only about our vision for the new foreign policy. And it triggered a lot of comments. You can ask her if you, if you like. Actually, the, the, a lot of workshops were organized to discuss specifics about our, our vision, how we would like to see Egypt in two years, what are our objectives for the coming two years, what are the objectives of the, of the Egyptian foreign policy, and what are the circles of interest to us. All this is there. And the president called. For, 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 and he established a forum, and he called for different political parts. He called the Council of the Egyptian Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, uh, he called uh, professors of the Faculty of uh, of uh, Political Sciences in in Cairo. I, I called them many players, and and that vision was discussed in detail, and that was pro broadcasted live on the air. I mean, how can we claim? And and that there has been a lot of implementations. The president has been touring the world, and how can we say that there is no vision? I I can accept that somebody criticizes that vision or says that there, there, there is, this is wrong or this, I don't agree with this, I don't agree with that. But to claim that there is no vision, this is totally unfair because there is a vision and it, it, we would love to have this discussed and criticized. And from this platform, I invite my friend Amr and all other political, I'm, I'm chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in the party. I invite them, I, I will invite, I will issue invitation to our political parties to discuss this. I have working papers. I I'm going to present these and we discuss this and we, we welcome 
all the input so that we can reach an agreement. This is what helps. But if we keep accusing each other that we have nothing, this is not going to help and this is not going to lead us anywhere. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me, um, well, I, I do believe, and I, I, I believe Amr and I will not disagree, and General Sif Eliezer will not disagree, that definitely foreign policy issues ought to be treated based on a bipartisan perspective. I mean, it's what, what decent countries uh, do, and what decent politicians do as well. I mean, we may disagree on a wide range of issues in relation to domestic uh, politics, uh, but when it comes to foreign policy priorities, we've got to build and develop, b articulate a platform, develop a vision based on bipartisanship. Honestly, I do not see a vision. I once again uh, reiterate my statement. I see actions, I see movement uh, around the globe, in the region and outside of the region, but it does not add up to a vision. Because a vision in foreign policy means that Number one, we have to define what Egyptian national interests are in the region and beyond. And if we have a definition of what Egyptian national interests are, I believe we would not be very assured uh, seeing that the foreign debt of Egypt is being owned to 20% by one country that is dangerous for any country in the sense of dependency and building dependency. Secondly, if we were to define, if we would have had a clear definition of what Egyptian national interests in the region and beyond are, we would have clear statements and clear actions, be it with regard to preserving and protecting the rights of Egyptians uh, in the Gulf and elsewhere, uh, promoting trade relations in the Nile Basin and in the Mediterranean region, not only in the Gulf, reaching out to Libya and Tunisia economically, that was done to an extent, I have to say, but to have, to have, to have a wholesale understanding, a package of what, consti what constitutes Egyptian national interests and how to go about it. Secondly, and once again, it's a reflection of what we miss domestically. You reach bipartisanship on foreign policy issues if you have a decent process of democratic deliberations. It's how this country goes about bipartisanship in foreign policy issues and how any democratic country goes about bipartisanship in relation to national security related issues or foreign policy issues. But because we lack democratic deliberations in Egypt, because we lack consensus on domestic as well as foreign issues, uh, we, we, we do not have it. We do not have that bipartisanship. The way to go about it would be to definitely create bodies uh, until we have uh, an elected parliament, until we have uh, completed our uh, legislative branch of government, it would be to have bodies for scholars, for politicians, for party members to sit down and discuss. Amr uh, Darag mentioned uh, the council which was established by the president. And as far as I know, and I speak about myself and uh, fellow politicians in different opposition parties, none of us was invited. So if you are not treating foreign policy issues in a bipartisan driven manner, what, what are you expecting the opposition to do? Of course, it will continue to cry out, no vision is there, and there is no vision there. The council was established, we were not invited. It's turning into a, 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 a body managed one-sidedly. Final remark, and let me be very upfront about that. Now, Egyptians need clarity and transparency with regard to who is managing foreign policy. It's, it's no longer acceptable that I see duality between the presidency and the foreign ministry. And I do not know who is man Is it the minister of foreign affairs? Is it the foreign minister? Or is it the president's assistant, the assistant to the president who is managing foreign affairs? And let me once again, very frankly tell you that Egyptian diplomats, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not quoting anyone here in the embassy you know, to undermine uh, their term. I'm quoting diplomats from elsewhere. They are receiving orders. They are receiving uh, requests, not addressed to them from the ministry, but from informal, informal institutions, which should not be part of the Egyptian foreign policy making, and that needs to be clarified. If you would like to have bipartisanship, so clarify who is running Egyptian foreign policy institutionally and invite us in, and we will not say no. It's, it's, about, it's about our country and our national interests.
Well, I succeed Amr Hamzawi that uh, I don't see a really political vision now in Egypt. Uh, in fact, uh, sometimes we have uh, a policy which we see regarding uh, an important regional issue uh, like Syria, for instance, and then uh, we found ourselves in front of our president uh, saying in Russia a different, uh, actually an opposite idea. Uh, we are succeeding very much the, in Egypt, uh, the revolution in Syria. We uh, are saying that uh, the revolutionaries are doing well. We are against Bashar al-Assad, against his regime. His regime has to step down. And suddenly, uh, that, that's a vision. What I call this is, okay, this is the policy of Egypt, that we are supporting the revolutionaries in, in Syria. We are supporting uh, the uh, free uh, army, Syrian free army. And then we found ourselves in front of announcement and a speech by our president in Russia, saying that we appreciate the Russian view and point uh, regarding Syria, and we are in agreement with that. That makes you 100 degree, degree opposite on the other side. Are we with the Russia with the Russian view? Ali, Ali, لا 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 لا. I think many. وهو موافق Ali. Ali, Ali. Okay. Ali, I can give. Ali, I can give. Ali, بالضبط. Oh. بس كده. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nagib. Nagib is saying that the statement. The statement was. Nagib just joined the Muslim Brotherhood. Nagib saying that the statement was that President said that. That he listened to the Russian view regarding Syria and. Uh, we understand where they are coming from. We are coming. They are coming from supporting Bashar al-Assad. He is not coming against. Uh, but the, the, the Russian. You want to tell me? Okay. Okay. The, you you want to tell me that the Russian against Bashar al-Assad. If you're saying that, okay, I agree with that. But anyway, that's not the only one. We we see different other uh, actually occasions that it was uh, very contradictory with with the with other policies. I mean, you go right or you go left. This is not clear. Plus, in fact. There's other gray areas and some in some issues in some political foreign issues, uh, uh, and and regarding, for instance, uh, what uh, Mr. Amr Hamza, uh, Mr. Amr Drag said regarding Mali, what I what I mean regarding that that we said uh, France, the French people, they are not allowed to go to intervene to to, interv to make intervention in in Mali and 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 shoot these groups. These groups are Qaeda. We have to stop talking about. It. Don't say anything. Leave it. If you don't want to be involved, to be involved, just say yes. I am listening and I'm watching the, the issue. But don't say that I am against that. You are against that. All right. You know what? What happens? They stopped the visit for for uh, President Morsi to to France. They said, okay, we'll delay it. Did number one. Number two, the euro money. The euro money again. It was stopped. So we are harming ourselves by that. We have to have a clear vision, political clear vision. It's not there. Thank you. Um, the, the comment that we understand where they're coming from reminds me of a colleague I used to work with in the State Department. It wasn't until I had worked with her for about six months that I realized when she said, I take your point, what she meant was, you're wrong. <laughs> and it always sounded so nice. I take your point. Like, wow, I've really persuaded her. No, she meant you're wrong. Anyway, um, what one, I, I finally learned, it only took six months. Uh, one question that, that I think is on people's minds is, is what is the proper relationship of what is happening in Egypt to what's happening in the rest of the region? Should Egypt consider itself to have a leadership role? Should it be an example? Should it inspire people? Should there be partnerships between Egypt and other groups or governments to try to, to, to have people learn from the Egyptian experience? Or should Egypt be considering its bilateral relationships, working with existing governments, governments that have not transitioned, governments that may be persecuting Islamist parties. How does the new Egypt relate to a region which is not entirely new? Okay. Well, inspiring is never a program. And in inspiring is never a set of uh, well-defined policies to inspire regionally. I believe Egypt in, in different periods in its long history inspired uh, the region and inspired humanity beyond the region and that was based on showing and documenting and signaling to the world uh, the fact that we are a strong nation knowing where we are going regardless of 
um, uh, how we evaluate uh, past experiences uh, in today's terms. Egypt was inspiring in, in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, projecting an image of a new nation uh, state, a modern nation state, well, uh, well able to define a clear place for religion and its politics, well able to uh, safeguard personal freedoms and to, to provide for modernization. Egypt was inspiring in the 1950s and 60s for different reasons, and Egypt will continue to inspire as long as we have progress in our country, which the region looks at and understands and affi affiliates or associates with. Having said that, let me, let me, let me say very briefly that I, I, I do believe that Egypt, regardless of the differences we have in our domestic politics between the Brotherhood uh, and liberal parties and leftist parties, that Egypt has to be and remain committed to promoting human rights and freedoms in the region. It's what we have to be promoting in the region um, and what we have at least to condition our foreign policy based on. Uh, I do not believe that we are a small nation. Uh, we are not a tiny nation in the region. We are an influential nation and we have to take human rights and defending freedoms and promoting democracy seriously. Therefore, once again, I agreed and continue to agree with the overall direction with regard to Syria, but I miss concrete actions on the ground, and I miss conditionality, Syria-related conditionality with regard to Iran. Therefore, I agree on reaching out to democratic governments or democratically legitimated governments in Tunisia and Libya on prioritizing them over countries which are uh, ruled by undemocratic governments. That is what we, what we have to defend in the region, and that is the only way to inspire. Secondly, commitment to democracy and human rights does mean that we have to avoid the backsliding on democracy and human rights in our, uh, in our society. And unfortunately, we continue to have uh, very negative developments in that regard, as far as I am concerned. We continue to have human rights violations. We have um, uh, growing, growing tensions with regard to freedom of expression, growing attempts to limit and restrict freedom of expression. And if we are serious about inspiring the region democratically, we have to do our job, our homework properly. We cannot avoid to backslide on, uh, on democracy. Thirdly, Egypt is inspiring by, by, by the very fact that we continue to have a pluralist uh, political space. And sometimes we do, not, we do not evaluate right how the region is looking at Egypt as of now. And trust me, because I met recently uh, Arab liberal uh, intellectuals and representatives of different Arab liberal parties from all over and movements, and they do follow our domestic debates very closely. So what is happening in Egypt and how uh, debates are unfolding with regard to religion and politics, with regard to equal citizenship rights, with regard to how, we are, how, how are we managing? Are we managing the issue of sectarian tensions and sectarian vi violence properly driven by a rule of law and uh, equal citizenship rights perspective? Yes or no? All of that is being watched very closely in the region. So we will inspire by understanding that we are that situation and developments in Egypt are monitored, and that if we do not backslide, we will definitely offer the region a model without going around saying that we are the model. It, it, it's, it, it's completely related to our domestic and internal developments, and if it goes in the right direction, which I continue to hope, definitely the region will take it seriously. Uh, in a way, I agree with Amr of, uh, most of what he said, and uh, uh, the thing is that when you when when you want to uh, to to act as a model and to be looked at as a model, uh, this should be uh, after things stabilized. In other words, the, the the current status within the transitional period cannot be taken as as a model. Definitely, we have difficulties right now, and we are not asking people to duplicate. Uh, what we are going through uh, during the transitional period. As a matter of fact, I do believe that we are passing the transitional period in a much better way than, uh, than other Arab Spring countries, although the, a, a lot of things are being criticized, as we, we always hear, but, uh, but still comparing to other Arab Spring countries, in a way, we are moving at a faster pace. But the, the problem is that 
uh, we are now in the middle of a transitional period. And this transitional period is, 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 is quite normal. Uh, it, it is after 60 years of, uh, of corruption, of oppression, of, uh, of all kinds of bad things that you all know. So the model of, of moving out of this situation after the Egyptian re revolution is in itself is, is a big model. This is something that is to be looked at very highly. The, the notion that we could manage to change after 60 years of military control over power into civilian control, no matter whether we like who, who that civilian is or not, but, but still this is a civilian control. This is a significant development. This is a very good model that many countries in the region and in the world are not still capable of escaping. This is, this is something that is to be cherished and looked at. But uh, uh, definitely we need to work hard in order to develop ourselves in a much better way to deserve our role, Egypt is, has always been the leader in the, in, the, in the area, not just in the Arab world, but in Africa and sometimes to some countries in Latin America. So this is what we hope will happen, and I, I, I hope that we improve our performance, all of us in Egypt, in order to reach this stage, to be really a model of what can happen after a big change like what we went through after the revolution. Yes, I guess the question is, are we uh, ready, Egypt is ready to be a model in the area uh, for others or not? Uh, right, well, let's see globally. Yes, we are ready because we are a great country. We are the largest country in the, in the area. We are a very important country in the Middle East and African Arab world. Everybody looks to Egypt as a great country, and this is reality. Whether it is under this system, under the Islamic system, or other systems, because Egypt is Egypt, with all the assets we have, people, and everything. But the point is, to be practically the model, you have to do a lot of things. It's not like talking. You have, to, as, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, do it, practice. How can we be uh, in front of the others, the model, real model in the area? I think, I guess, by many things. Very few items, just for, for before the red card uh, uh, John used against me. Very quickly, number one, by having a clear foreign policy, not only with the with the international arena but also the arab world as we mentioned before and africa we are ignoring africa somehow africa is not in our priority uh, right now yes they are doing some work but it's not enough number two democracy and democracy and democracy we have to practice democracy internally to prove to the others that we are a good model that this revolution came with the result the result we were not practicing um, uh, democracy before 25th of january we have to practice democracy and not talking about democracy what we are doing now is giving announcement giving speeches about democracy but we are not practicing democracy the number three which is very important respecting law we have to respect they have to respect law from the highest level going down to the end of the line. Are we doing that in Egypt now to be a model? I, I, I guess no. Equality, women, and other Egyptians has to be equal to give a model to the area, to give a model to the, uh, to the uh, Arab world and to the world that there is a change in Egypt. I don't think we have the equality right now in Egypt for everybody. And, and that has to be a model. And has to be a model and in the highest our priority, in the, in the highest priority of, our, of, of Egypt, meaning that. Talking about it, put it in the Constitution in, in different way, indirectly, I don't think that's enough. Practicing it, we have to show people that we have real equality in everybody. Are we doing that now or not? That's another question. Thank you. Um, with great temerity, after I ask my next question, I'm going to go back to questions, but I really am going to ask that, that we hold by the rules. The last question I have, um, Ahmed Hamzawi several times talked about the importance of conditionality in Egypt's foreign policy conditionality with Syria, conditionality with Iran. The issue of conditionality is a huge issue in the United States and its policy toward Egypt. Should there be conditionality, both as Egypt relates to its neighbors and as other countries relate to Egypt? OK. Uh, I don't think uh, conditionality is the right word when it comes to equivalent relationship between sovereign countries okay when we talk when you talk about relationship between sovereign countries you talk about mutual interests you talk about mutual benefits you talk about cooperation you talk about hand in hand not an upper hand and a lower hand okay 
So this is, this is how the relationship should be between sovereign countries. And what one of the cornerstones of our vision, uh, new vision for foreign policy, is to have uh, our relationship with all countries on equal basis. Uh, uh, we are a sovereign country. We, we accept friendship. We are looking for, for friendship with everybody. When we apply this to the United States, the United States is a very important country in this world. It's a strategic country. The relationship between Egypt and the United States is strategic. But in order for that relationship to be sustainable, it has to be correct. It has to be on equal basis. It has to be based on interest. If we start talking about, I I'm not going to give you this unless you do this and that, this is not a healthy relationship. What are we getting from the United States? We are getting, wh wh when, when, when it comes to conditionality, we are talking about financial aid and military aid. If you talk about financial aid, we are talking about little more than $200 million a year. For your information, the growth national product of Egypt is more than 260 billion US dollars a year. So this is actually nothing. When you talk about military aid, I don't like to call it aid. I, I like to call it uh, uh, something that, uh, that the US invests in order to achieve its interests in the area. This is something that is causing, and, I, and this, these actually are not my words. Uh, that These were my words of, of General Zaini. We were having a panel a couple of days ago in Williamsburg, and he explained very clearly that the United States is getting in return of this so-called support much more than, than it, is, it is paying. So when we, when we talk about good relationships between friendly countries, we talk about balanced relationship based on respect and not based on conditionality and, and, uh, and upper hand and lower hand and this sort of thing. Yes, uh, I'm very much against uh, the way of conditionality uh, regarding the foreign policy or putting pressure to another country to get whatever you want. I think uh, the dialogue and, uh, and the normal relation, diplomatic relation, uh, can be actually much better than having uh, conditions to the others and putting pressure on them to get whatever you want. This, this policy, uh, yes, it, is, it, it has been done before many times. It has been practiced uh, many times before. I don't think right now with the new uh, history and the new uh, uh, policy uh, of uh, dealing between the countries and the world now, I, th I don't think it is the right one. Meaning that, uh, uh, yes, uh, sometimes you, have, you are under pressure. And that's, this is politics, and you have to uh, accept that. But it doesn't mean that the whole way you have to have conditions on your shoulder to, to go ahead for uh, the need of others. Thank you very much, John. That is uh, for um, uh, politicians in, uh, in the respective country to decide upon. So I'm not going to speak uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the US. Uh, as far as I am concerned and from an Egyptian perspective, and I'm going to give you an exact uh, example to, uh, to make my point clear. I was uh, one of those who met Senator uh, McCain as he came recently with a delegation, a congressional delegation to Egypt, uh, and we met him, the National Salvation Front met him, um, and he asked us uh, about conditionality on the aid package. Uh, the economic as well as the military aid package, and our uh, answer was uh, we are not going to, and we are not asking for conditionality on the aid package. Egypt needs the aid package, and it's in our country's interest, and we are not willing to compromise on national interests for uh, pick pickering between opposition and government. And so we, 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 we pushed that out. And that is Definitely an issue which I do not like to uh, to be to be in a gray zone about. As far as our national interest is concerned, I believe the aid package, especially the military aid package, is needed. The economic aid package is less significant, but the military aid package is needed. And as Amr Darag was mentioning, there are different calculations behind the military aid package. On the other side, as far as Egypt is concerned, what I meant by conditionality is that we have to have. A clear, a clear list of priorities, a clear list of interests which we are defining, and we have to shape our foreign policy actions, our regional actions, based on that. 
I do not mind telling the Iranians, and it's our mandate, uh, the government's uh, obligation to tell the Iranians that we are not willing to accept that they continue to promote the dictatorship, which is killing Syrians in a daily, uh, in a daily fashion. Uh, I believe it is the obligation of the government, of the existing administration, to tell and to signal to the Gulf region that while we are not uh, after uh, changing their regimes and monarchies, that we are not going to compromise on human rights and freedoms in Egypt. So we have to make it clear where we stand and what do we stand for. That is the only way to go about foreign policy regionally and internationally in a proactive manner. Otherwise, it's going to be as is, as of now, which is actions, steps, and vision is missing. Thank you. Now we'll go to questions. Again, the rules are one question, identify yourself. Your question has to be in the form of a question. And I'm going to try to call on people who I didn't call on the first panel, because there are a lot of people who can get called on. Mohammed Shinawi in the front row, because you've been very patient. So right here. Plus, I've known Mohammed for 15 years. So. Mohammed Shinawi, Voice of America. Uh, how would you envision a regional role for Egypt, let alone a leading uh, role when it is suffering from political, economic, and security problems. Two years ago, after the revolution, I talked to General Samah about reforming the police. And he said transitional, transitional justice is lacking in Egypt. And two years later, it's still lacking. So I'd like just to know how you are envisioning this role. I, I believe I addressed this point because I said that you cannot have a successful role outside your country and a successful foreign uh, foreign policy without having building your own country in a, in, a, in a good way. I mean, this is this is ABC, and uh, and uh, for the particular point related to the police, and this is a very difficult task. And and actually, the 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 effort of everybody in Egypt is needed to be directed into into this because. The, the, the whole structure of the police forces in Egypt have been built during the previous era, uh, uh, from the, the youngest to the oldest uh, one. The whole system was built on protecting the regime rather than protecting the, the security and the safety of people. And without even knowing, it's becoming a culture. They may, w no matter who the regime is, they may be willing, part of them would be willing to, to protect the, the regime rather than concentrating on the on the security of the society. So this is something that needs needs uh, a, a, a lot of consensus and a lot of effort to be done. And I, I totally agree that this is an absolute uh, important. Thank you. Right here. Khaled. No, Khaled. There you go. Up, up. Khaled. Yeah. There you go. You'll get your chance. Uh, Khaled al Gindi with the Brookings Institution and uh, also with the Egyptian American Rule of Law Association. My question is, uh, sort of uh, picks up on something that Amr Hamzawi raised, which is this duality and who's making foreign policy in the absence of, of transparency. And it seems to me that there's another actor in that equation that wasn't mentioned, and that's the military, as far as foreign policy uh, issues are concerned. So my question actually is a, is a fairly narrow one. Recently, we've, we've heard from uh, Israeli uh, military authorities of, of various types that security coordination with Israel has never been better. It's better than it was under Mubarak. Uh, we've seen uh, the destruction of something like 200 uh, tunnels uh, be between the Sinai and Gaza. So my question maybe um, I I'd welcome uh, all of you to respond. Um, I is, this, I is this part of this duality um, issue? Is this a result? Are these initiatives being taken? By the, at the initiative, at the behest of Mohammed Mursi as president, as commander in chief, and as the chief, uh, presumably the chief foreign policy maker, or is it, are they, are these decisions being uh, taken with the acquiescence of Mohammed Mursi? And obviously, there's a, 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 a distinction. So, the subtext is the role, I suppose, of uh, of the military in formulating those uh, those policies versus the presidency. Okay, I'll take that. Uh, I guess... <laughs> and there's a sigh of relief from the rest of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I guess nothing has been changed. Uh, uh, the announcement from the Israeli side that it is better now, I don't think it's correct. It's the same thing from my point. I, I, I'm, I'm close to that. I know what's going on. I believe the relation with Israel uh, regarding the uh, border, the mutual border with, the, with Israel, as well as the, uh, the Gaza Strip, I think it's the same. Uh, my uh, the appendix, the security appendix of the peace treaty, uh, item five, I guess, uh, we have to have liaison uh, liaison officers between the con two countries uh, in regard of the peacekeeping forces uh, in 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 Sinai as well as uh, what's going on in in the border. Yes, uh, there is a um, kind of contacts on maybe um, daily basis or weekly basis uh, between the two sides to organize that and uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the border at least uh, in 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 the way the the, the you want, or at, at least from both sides, not only from one, so one side. In regard of the tunnels, uh, yes, it is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, different policy now that they have to uh, destroy the, the, the tunnels, and they are. The army is taking uh, this uh, in his shoulder, and he's doing that on daily basis now. Uh, it's not yet 200 uh, tunnels, as you mentioned, has been uh, destroyed. Uh, I think it's close to 120, 140, uh, but they're still doing that every day. Uh, they are doing it by um, putting, uh, flooding a lot of salt, salty water to the tunnels uh, in, in the places which uh, they have some um, housing and, and people living on top of it. And the other, uh, other tunnels, uh, they destroy it if it's far away from the uh, housing area. Uh, yes, the army is doing that now, and uh, the harm from the tunnels is unbelievable. It's beyond your imagination. Uh, we are very, very much uh, harmed. The, the national uh, security of the country is, is severely harmed every day by leaving these tunnels alive. One, one sentence. Ba base, basically, once again, uh, trying to, um, to clarify why is a duality. Uh, with regard to the decision-making process on foreign policy as well as national security issues uh, is quite, uh, quite uh, challenging, uh, I believe. Egypt uh, has always had foreign policy institutions or institutions within its state working on foreign policy issues. And uh, they have been uh, traditionally the foreign ministry, uh, the military establishment, and uh, the intelligence uh, institutions. And those three uh, actors have always been part of shaping, of course with the presidency, of shaping uh, foreign policy priorities uh, for Egypt. What is dangerous as of now is, number one, that unfortunately, and maybe it takes time, but we, we have to, to, to really take very seriously the principle of civilian oversight. And so I'm saying that knowing that the president uh, in office as of now does not belong to the uh, political line I represent, but we have to take civilian oversight very seriously. It is a presidency with parliament which have to set the foreign policy priorities and whoever else in Egypt or whatever else in terms of institutions is an implementing institution, not a policy making institution. And that needs to be very clear. Secondly, the duality. I we were one sentence. Hmm? That was well, one well, second sentence. <laughs> <laughs> right, second, sen second sentence. Is, and once again, I'm not really taking it in the direction of pickering between government and opposition. But I believe that we are undermining the, the duality between the uh, decision-making uh, process within the Muslim Brotherhood and the decision-making process within the presidency and the role of the foreign ministry and so on and so forth, that that is, because it's uh, dealt, dealt with in an untransparent manner, that undermines institutions and the capacity of institutions to implement foreign policy, foreign policy action. So I hope that we will have more transparency in Egypt that we will know that it is a foreign ministry which uh, implements foreign policy, not somewhere else uh, in a place where, where we have no access to. Because once again, civilian oversight should be designed, should be designed to, to, add, to respond to us citizens, knowing who is doing what. We'll go right here. Right. Huh? No, we're behind you. Yeah. No, 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 no. Behind. Behind Khaled. Mohammed uh, Al-Satouhi. Actually, I heard a statement from uh, General uh, Sefil Yazal 
uh, about Iran, uh, uh, did you say that you'll build a nuclear weapon by September? Is this what you said? The end of September, he said. Early September, because as a journalist in Washington for 20 years, I have to tell you this would make head headlines in Washington, because even the Israeli uh, intelligence, which has been crying wolf about this issue for years, they agree now that this would take at least a year for them to have the capacity to weaponize their program. So I, don't, I, I respect that you have your own sources, but I just wanted to clarify that. Yehud Barak said that uh, two weeks ago here in, in San Francisco uh, in, in a big seminar, and uh, I've seen it in, uh, in the video as well. Uh, not only Yehud Barak is saying that, but the other information uh, is uh, actually confirming that they are in the very, very end uh, steps of producing it. And uh, actually, Yehud Barak said actually where it's going to be produced as well. So uh, it's kind of definite information. And he said that, yes. Yehud Barak said that, and it's in YouTube, by the way. You can, you can look at it. Just put <laughs> Yehud Barak and let us visit in the States, you will find it. Um, Shadwa Hassan from Cairo University. I just have a, a one small question, since you said that you are heading to an equal relationship with the Gulf state countries. While some of the prominent members of the Freedom and Justice Party have just in two days ago said that most of the stolen Egyptians' money are actually not in foreign banks, but in Abu Zabi Bank. So how come that you just, uh, which, which was actually Mr. Ariane, so how come that you are saying that you're heading to an equal relationship with all Gulf countries, and what happens with respect to the Egyptian peoples working in these countries while you're just saying that, that things? Thank you. Well, actually, uh, this is a question to be asked to Mr. Ryan to, 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 to get his sources. But, but anyway, the, the, the point is that I, I, I didn't say that, uh, that we, we do have uh, a balanced relationship between the, or a good relationship with uh, all the Gulf states. states. I, what I said is that we hope to have that. And if, the, if, the, if, if there are money in, 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 in any country's banks, this doesn't mean that our relationship with that country should be ruined. I mean, if, if, if this is just information that some, some people went and put the money in, the, in these banks, this should not be the basis of ruining the information. But uh, I, I don't see actually the relevance of your question. I, it, it is definitely to the best interest of Egypt to have good relationship with all the countries in the world, but starting from the Arab countries, and the priority would be to the Gulf countries. I, I cannot be more clear than that. The lady over here in the white. Hi, I'm Dina Gerges. I'm with the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Um, my first question was to Mr. Darag. Um, you only mentioned, one. all right, um, Mr. Darag, you mentioned that um, this idea of sort of a, a new relationship based on mutual respect, and um, there we see a lot of sort of public statements from the Muslim Brotherhood regarding uh, Egypt's sovereignty and the fact that you know the United States should not intervene. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting because this is sort of the public role that the Muslim Brotherhood adopts, but privately it's no secret that there is delegation upon delegation um, headed by people like Aysam al Haddad that descend onto Washington DC to specifically garner support for domestic policy um, advanced by the Muslim Brotherhood. So I was just wondering if you could comment on that dichotomy of the public versus private role. And very quickly to Amr Hamzawi, no, you mentioned that there Dina, was... Dina, Dina, please. Just no, no, very... No, no, please, please, because, because I'm trying to enforce the rule equally for everybody. And the rule is one question. And we said when you started one question, so I'd be grateful, Dr. Okay. Alman, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad Dina asked that question because when, when you talk about visits of Dr. Assam al-Haddad uh, to Washington, he's doing these visits not as a capacity of a Muslim brother, he's doing this as the first assistant of the U Egyptian president for foreign, foreign policy, okay, foreign, foreign affairs. And actually, uh, this is also important to clarify and maybe response to <coughs> some of the points that the Amr also raised. In the Constitution, the, 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 the responsibility of foreign relations is primarily in the hands of the President. The President is in charge of national security, foreign relations, you know, and this, this kind of stuff, while the government is taking care of all the domestic, domestic issues and, uh, and uh, internal affairs. So 
it is the presidency establishment, according to the Constitution, that should be leading the foreign policy. And also, my information is that, and, and I, I personally talked a lot with the Minister of Foreign Affairs himself. I'm not talking about talks uh, from this embassy or that embassy. The Minister of Foreign Affairs himself, he assured me that they are taking full control of all files, and that many of the files that they, they used not to have any access to they are now in the hands of the Foreign, foreign uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they are in excellent coordination with the presidency establishment. So uh, 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 I, I, I hope that we, we let people who are doing their jobs do their jobs. I mean, he is the assistant president for uh, the, the assistant of the president for foreign relations. There is nothing wrong with going to Washington or, or any other country to 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 have good re to to try to pave the way for good relationship with uh, with the U.S. U.S. is as I said is a very important country to Egypt. It's a strategic country to Egypt. And having a balanced relationship with the U.S. does not mean that we do not have a relationship with the U.S. We we, we are hoping to have good relationship with the U.S. Um, I am afraid that we have run out of time. Um, I want to thank our panelists for participating. I want to thank the panelists on the first time. I want to thank you for your patience. If you have individual questions to ask individuals, please come up. Thank you very much for joining us today.